All right. So welcome. I'm delighted today to welcome my friend and colleague, Dr. Barbara Pitkin. Barbara is a senior lecturer in religious studies at Stanford University, and she's been teaching there since 1996. Today, I have the great pleasure of spending time discussing with Barbara her recent book. Her recent book is titled Calvin, the Bible and History, and it was published by Oxford University Press this past June, so June 2020. Barbara, it's a great delight to have you here and to be able to talk with you about your book and its various themes. So I'd like to start out with kind of the, the first question, which is really what led you to work on this book and how does it how does it build on your previous scholarship? Well, uh, thanks, Corrine, for asking me to do this and being your guinea pig for the first video podcast. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm excited to do that now that we're also Zoom savvy. Uh, this topic of Calvin and the Bible and history has really been with me for a very long time. Um, uh, I think uh, certainly even when I was a grad student, I, I got fascinated with this. I took a class on uh, the history of uh, biblical interpretation and ended up writing a paper on Calvin on the Psalms. Mm -hmm. And I was really struck by how different some of his comments and his treatments of some of the Psalms seemed um, different from interpreters, even other interpreters who were really interested in sort of the plain or literal or historical, grammatical, genuine sense of scripture, the, the sort of straightforward narrative sense. Um, and I uh, also discovered in the course of, of that engagement with his work on the Psalms, uh, that, I was, that, that what was really um, motivating him in his commentary on the Psalms was the doctrine of providence, the theme of providence. Mm -hmm. And I, that's what led to the topic of my dissertation in my first book which was looking at the exegetical underpinnings of Calvin's doctrine of faith. And um, it was specifically by the example of his commentary on the Psalms that I was looking at how he developed and, um, and richly engaged with a the theme of faith in providence. And um, so that was looking at his theology of history in a way. Mm -hmm. um, and that um, after that project was done, um, I was still kind of captivated by his interest in history and historical development as the past. Um, and I was interested in how that played out in his exegetical work across the board in ways. So I began working on some soundings and individual projects um, mm -hmm. on different um, aspects of his exegesis, looking always uh, for this idea of history and also becoming really fascinated with um, how the exegetical tradition was interested in the historical senses of scripture and the, the um, Bible as a historical artifact, but also how um, in Calvin's age and in the early modern period in general, Renaissance thinkers were um, really um, changing the way that the past was studied and looking for new ways to find, um, to adequately understand the past. I mean, yep. in, in the sense of um, new ways of, of thinking about the authorities of the past and the authority of tradition. Um, and also then thinking about this really pressing practical issue about how to apply the lessons of the past today. So trying to, to think about his exegesis in that bigger context is what brought me to, to this out of my earlier research. So it allows you really to both look at the wider sweep of scripture from the focus on the Psalms, mm -hmm. broadening it out mm -hmm. that way, but right. then also looking at this particular theme. And I like the, the connection with authority in particular, because I think mm -hmm. more and more to my mind, a lot of what's going on in the Reformation is essentially a debate over the nature of authority and what is authoritative and how do we decide what is authoritative. And that's an ongoing debate, isn't it? Right, right. The authority of tradition in the past. And when we, we see it, you know, in our own days, too, and mm -hmm. in different ways that we think about our heritage. So that's, that gives it kind of a contemporary relevance and feel when you, you understand the urgency of that question in the 16th absolutely. century. No, absolutely. I mean, I see it with my students when perhaps they make a very straightforward assumption that when the Reformation said scripture alone, or when Luther said scripture alone, that that somehow just brushed away tradition, but it's, it's really not so, is it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, 
it's not it's not even true for the previous tradition um, in terms of how they deal with the Bible. That's I think what makes the history of biblical interpretation so fascinating. Absolutely, um, absolutely. Yeah. So, what did you feel you discovered about Calvin over the course of working on this book? Well, so I mean, I did say that that earlier on I had worked also on his interpretation of the New Testament um, and uh, Paul, especially uh, John, some of the other. New Testament epistles too. So I had looked at a wider range of his exegesis in the first project, but not through this lens of history um, per se. And by looking at um, New Testament and a broader range of Old Testament uh, uh, commentaries or lectures or sermons, um, I uh, found out first of all that Calvin has a very consistent historical interest and attention to the historical dimensions of the theme of history when he is um, talking about the Bible and its meaning, but it's much more complex than I first imagined. Somewhat what you said, I mean, not that it's just scripture alone, but he doesn't have a one-size-fits-all approach, um, which makes sense because his one of his ideals for interpretation, is, as everyone knows who's read the preface to the Romans commentary or the, the um, dedicatory epistle, that he attends to the mind of the author. He wants to uh, explain what the text means in terms of the author's own terms. And for Calvin, of course, the author is, the biblical author is writing under divine guidance, but he wrote in a particular historical context. And so Calvin always wants to explain that. But in different genres of biblical literature, um, and even within the same genre, say prophecy, uh, the understanding of the author's circumstances can look a little bit different. And um, so if you take just maybe like three examples, with Paul, he does talk about who the Galatians are and where Paul is um, when he's writing this letter and why he's writing it, why he's concerned with this issue. Um, but he also uh, very much understands Paul as someone who is teaching universal doctrine. Um, so, and also that he uh, holds up uh, examples for uh, moral behavior or pastoral behavior. So Paul, um, he doesn't historicize Paul quite as much, but he does still understand that Paul, um, Paul's struggles against his opponents in Galatia are not the same at, as the struggles that Calvin's having with his opponents in the 16th century. Mm -hmm. There are similarities, but there's, there's a key difference that he's keen to point out. Mm -hmm. And then within the realm of prophecy, I think what's interesting is, um, I mean, one of the earliest pieces I did was on his lectures on Daniel. And there Calvin is uh, quite different from the way other people had handled Daniel's prophecies and particularly um, Nebuchadnezzar's uh, dream and of the four monarchies and that Calvin understands the prophecies in the book of Daniel to have um, with the exception of the prophecy of the final resurrection in chapter 12 all of those other prophecies are fulfilled in Christ's first coming mm -hmm. not in his second coming at the end of time and uh, that was really quite unusual for a Christian interpreter. Mm -hmm. But in the book of Isaiah, he takes a rather different view of the prophecies. He still contextualizes Isaiah and talks about his times and his audience and why he is saying what he is doing there. But he operates more there with an idea of multiple fulfillment of prophecies that they could be fulfilled in Isaiah's time, but also apply to the time of Christ or the life of the church, especially later. So oh, no. not much more complicated, even what it means to say the historical is, is operative there. Um, Absolutely. And does, it, does he make a distinction or did you see any pattern if you compared, for instance, his commentaries to his sermons in terms of how he understands or uh, explains the historical context? Uh, I think that in general, I mean, in a couple of points in, in, in the chapter on Paul, um, I looked at the genres of the sermons and the commentary and the um, congregations. We actually have some congregations on uh, uh, Galatians too. And it's true, he is a little bit more attentive to philology and um, to uh, historical context, geography, things like that, when he's doing a commentary. But he, he does mention it from time to time in the sermons. And I think that 
um, what the book ends with these um, sermons he preached on Second Samuel during the first religious war in France. And I think the thing that made me so fascinated in that one was how he actually invites his congregation listening to the sermon to compare their own experience to yep. the experience of Israel at the time, that it's not the preacher telling them how to make the connection, but he's opening up this space in the context of the sermon for them to uh, engage their own faith in this way. And so it's it's a different, it's a way of applying the history that that was, we don't often see in the commentaries, I think. Yep. Um, Absolutely. You know, he's, he'll often, the commentaries say, this is what we should learn. He says that in the sermons too, but. Um, no, I think, and yeah. I think that that option of looking at the sermons as well really enriches what we know about yeah. Calvin as an exegete, isn't it? Because mm -hmm. a lot of times people have concentrated on the commentaries because not all the sermons are available in English. And if you're reading English, you kind of want to read the commentaries. But yeah. um, I think it's really important to also look at the sermons. Yeah. It just yeah. makes, uh, it shows Calvin almost how Calvin you could think, interprets the Bible for a more general audience, right? Right. I mean, there, I think there's, um, the other thing about looking at sermons that's so interesting is that it's pretty clear he's very interested in both past history, but in the present historical situation. And yet he only rarely, even in the sermons, makes clear connections to what's going on right. in in Geneva or France or wherever. He doesn't make these specific references himself. And so I think another sort of surprising thing was realizing that that is one piece of something that's really important for him, that for Calvin, interpreting scripture is a collaborative endeavor. Mm -hmm. And that we, we have these commentaries, we have these lectures now written and we don't imagine the context in which they were written and or delivered <laughs> even. Right. Um, the sermons too, we have to imagine the setting. And I think, um, you know, that the, the Bible as such a important cultural um, aspect of Geneva's um, daily life and uh, economic life uh, mm -hmm. in at the time is it, I think thinking through, trying to think through um, with work by you and so many other people who work, have worked on these social contexts in Geneva and in, in uh, France, uh, thinking about, uh, that broader environment and collaborative. He wasn't just a scholar alone in his study when he no. did this, that he was puzzling out the meaning of the past and its applicability to the present um, in constant engagement um, in the lecture hall, in the congregation, um, in uh, the sermon. Absolutely. And that actually leads to another really interesting question, which is a point which you raised in your work that Calvin is often working in great haste. Um, he has a lot on his plate. He is a very busy man. And he has sermons to prepare and lectures to give. And can you say anything about what, how that might shape his work if he's always doing things in a, seeming like a tearing hurry in the middle of 20 other things he also needs to be doing? So I will say I also work in great haste. And that is a phrase I take from John Thompson. <laughs> um, who point, who used that in uh, an article on Calvin's exegetical legacy. So I think um, uh, for the full answer, you'd have to go back to John's article. Mm -hmm. But I think when things, you, we have to think, the more we know about what daily life was like, uh, and maybe we just have to recover that. I think earlier scholars had a sense of that, but didn't prioritize it or have so much of the tools we have for, for understanding it. But we must, you must think that Calvin must have had kind of boundless energy for someone who was chronically in poor health and focus. <laughs> um, you know, he probably had a pretty modest collection of writings that he was using anytime he was composing any work of exegesis or anything else, um, uh, but he really had, he very had very little leisure to consult his sources. If in a given week, he might be preaching seven to eight sermons and attending the congregation and the consistory and giving lectures, plus writing letters, plus trying to put out fires other places. Um, he certainly did have to work very efficiently. Um, and we think too, that I think that, you know, the, a number of these, things that we now have texts were delivered extemporaneously, mm -hmm. um, that he 
he had a very strong um, uh, focus on work ethic. Absolutely. And I think our colleague Max Engemach in Geneva has been looking at um, early uh, printings of Calvin's commentaries where you can actually see in the actual printing the corrections mm. that Calvin was making as this new, say, the second edition was coming out. That there's actually parts of the text where things have been literally glued over, new pieces of paper yeah. glued over what he wanted yeah. to paint. So almost yeah. watching the editing process yeah. in action. Yeah. That's fascinating. Yeah. And I think it's with the commentaries, a lot of them didn't go through second, and Romans is the only one that really goes through second editions and third editions in, in that case. Um, you know, what we know from the Institutes, it holds to a bit in Romans too, I think that uh, Calvin, when he, it's not, he's not like Melanchthon, he doesn't rewrite everything and try to come to a better articulation of it. He does glue in new pieces and sometimes move things around, but he doesn't often re rewrite things. So, um, I think for someone who had to work rather quickly and did at times want to amend what he said, he um, often didn't uh, change the content, but merely just augmented what he said. Yeah, so which is understandable. Time. Again, with the pressure of yeah. time, it's a perfectly right. reasonable strategy. Right. <laughs> so are there other points, other ideas, or other uh, aspects of your work that you'd like to highlight that I haven't really mentioned that you think, well, you know what, people really need to understand this about Calvin as an exegete or as a scholar looking at the use of history in scripture? Um, well, I think that one of the things that um, certainly uh, caught my attention when I first worked on the Psalms um, and uh, has continued to motivate me and also has been really stimulated by work that some of our colleagues have done are the, are the way that Calvin arrives at these kind of unprecedented conclusions or strategies for dealing with the history of scripture. And sometimes they kind of landed him into trouble or got him criticized by people. So um, again, it's, it's uh, I've got a chapter that looks at the gospel of John and tries to contextualize how, you know, who Calvin explicitly denies that texts of the Christian tradition long had and still continues in some corners to take as proof texts of Christ's divine nature um, or uh, proof texts of Chalcedonian uh, Christology, Calvin explicitly denies that the author of the gospel was talking about that or writing mm -hmm. against the Ebionites or, um, and uh, that was quite curious. I mean, other, other interpreters like Busser and Melanchthon had sort of downplayed that and focused more on reading John for its soteriology rather than a um, document, uh, primarily uh, more than the other three gospels proving Christ divine and human nature. Mm -hmm. But Calvin was explicit in saying that is not what the author of the gospel is writing about. <clears throat> yeah. And similarly, um, I mean, he does that with the, with the Christological, the Messianic Psalms and Sujan Pak's work has yes. really explored that. And, and that was what had caught my attention in reading some of the Psalms too, that Calvin's interested in understanding them as, well, uh, if they are Davidic Psalms, they're not all. Mm -hmm. um, where are we in the life of David? That he, what trial is he facing? That's causing him to to do that and um you know also with, with daniel that he is not predicting the end times he's yes. not writing about the holy roman empire <laughs> yep. um, all of these things that um were quite unpopular um in the in the history of tradition calvin was quite explicit about that the only way to understand the meaning of the bible is um that the that the, the the writers of the Bible, the biblical authors, speak their truths to us um, out of their own historical context and through their own historical situations. So mm -hmm. uh, I think that that's where we come back to this theme of providence, that the unity of scripture is um, through, uh, and the unity of scriptural history is all because it is guided by divine providence. And since for Calvin, it's really impossible to understand how providence is working when you consider the events of your own day. Um, yep. That's why he's, he believes that the history of scripture and getting it right is really important so that you can understand how providence has worked in the past. And then consider that it might give you some comfort to know that it's worked in the past and that you might get through this yourself. The particular trials that people are facing. Yeah. Does that help explain perhaps why he never did a commentary or a sermon series as far as we know on Revelation? 
yeah, that's that's uh, it's very curious. There's very few uh, aspects of the Bible that he didn't uh, talk about. Um, I think Irene Bacchus has looked, you know, speculated a little bit about why that is. I think he, it, that was the other thing was I also had hoped to find something about his, um, his ideas about the end times and the end of history. Mm -hmm. And I, he, he, that was not something he was much interested in. He was interested in um, history as the unfolding of human history and, and affairs under the guidance of providence. And he was interested as, in history as a past record, mm -hmm. um, both of secular life, but also the life of the church. But he didn't want to speculate much about the end. And I suspect that might in part be because of the anxieties over being labeled a radical reformer. I mean, if you want to talk, who is most likely to be talking about prophecy and <laughs> end times and so on, there were certainly a number of the radical reformers that were much more that way inclined. And I think Calvin was consistently very reluctant to be tarred with that particular brush and was I, I think, not yeah. to go down that road. I think that's true. I think he also had just a um, a darkened sense of human fallenness mm -hmm. that um, you know people, of course, like to forget that like to to think about Calvin. We all know as the as the only person who ever articulated a doctrine of predestination. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, but he wasn't the only. Absolutely. Maybe you've done a whiteboard on this yes. <laughs> in your whiteboard lectures. He wasn't the only one, not yep. the first, not the last. And mm -hmm. he always believed that you couldn't know. No one could know. Calvin couldn't know who was saved and who wasn't. Yep. Um, sometimes you could have some ideas. Some people in Geneva thought Calvin was calling them reprobate. He probably did. But, you know, realistically, mm -hmm. he he didn't know that. It was important that you knew that there was a, a meaning to it all. Absolutely. Yeah. But you didn't need the details. Well, Barbara, this is so helpful. Thank you. I really yeah. appreciate this. It's been fun to be able to talk with you about these topics. I have and I hope sure. that, yeah, show me the book. Show the book. There you are. Calvin, yeah. the Bible in History, published by Oxford mm -hmm. University Press, yep. just out this past June. Barbara, thank you so much. Yep. Thank you.